For this week's episode, we're doing something a little different. Rather than sharing an episode with me interviewing a guest, we're borrowing some interviews from two other podcasts and sharing those with you here. Back in 2021, Bostick started two podcasts where we interview sustainability experts from different industries and have them share their insights and advice about how to transition to more sustainable business models. Those two podcasts are Transitions and Bostick Talks. Transitions features external experts, and Bostick Talks features Bostick's own internal CSR experts. And since two of the recent episodes from those podcasts feature insights on sustainability in the absorbent hygiene industry, we thought you all might like to hear those. Welcome to Attached to Hygiene, the podcast that enables you to grow your knowledge and influence in the absorbent hygiene industry. My name is Jack Hughes, and my mission is to help you, the absorbent hygiene article producer, design and produce the best possible products to meet the needs of your customers. On today's episode, you'll hear two different conversations on sustainability in the absorbent hygiene industry. The first conversation features Susie Hewson, founder and CEO of NatraCare. Susie started NatraCare in 1989 and has spent the last 30 plus years growing the company and their product line to the point that they now have over 25 sustainable and natural hygiene products available for sale in more than 80 countries. So it's safe to say that Susie not only has a wealth of experience in the absorbent hygiene industry, but also on how far the industry has come and how far we still have to go on our sustainability mission as an industry. The second conversation is actually with me, but rather than hearing me interview someone, you'll actually hear my perspective on sustainability in the industry based on my six and a half years of working at Bostic and conducting dozens of interviews with industry experts on this podcast. So I hope you enjoy this change of pace in hearing from two other podcasts in the market. Welcome to a new episode of Transitions, a podcast by Bostique. Waste treatment, bio-based materials, carbon footprint. With the need to transition to a more sustainable world, new needs and trends are constantly emerging. Some of them could have a direct impact on Bostique. In today's episode, we're interested in how hygiene products are becoming both safer and more sustainable, and are delighted to welcome Susie Houston, founder of NatraCare. Susie launched NatraCare in 1989 after learning about the damaging impacts of dioxin and plastic pollution on the planet and the human body, and created the world's first natural period products. Her goal is to protect both women's health and the environment, and she's here to tell us exactly how she's doing it. Hi, Susie. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate in the episode. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Could you please start off by introducing yourself? Uh, my name's Susie Hewson. Uh, so I'm the founder and developer of Nature Care Feminine Hygiene Products. I'm based here in Bristol. And when I started to look at development, I was not a product developer, nor in business. I was a campaigner looking for changes in the feminine hygiene industry. So out of passion for the environment, I decided to create a brand that would challenge the status quo that was pretty fixed in its attitude towards raw materials. Can you tell us why you decided to launch NatraCare? The turning point came in my bathroom about 1am, having watched a program that was about dioxin pollution in the environment created by the pulping industry. It was a program that looked in, in detail at the kinds of products that were impacted by this. So that included feminine hygiene, baby diapers, coffee filters, incontinence products. And the general attitude in the industry was one that there was nothing for women to worry about. Everything was under control, whereas the science was saying exactly the opposite. And, and also mindful that I'm also an environmentalist. I've worked with environmental organizations and I knew that the science was correct. And so I just got angry and, and that turning point came when I decided the only way forward was to continue to campaign and to challenge industry by putting my own product in the market. And what you should also realize that that was before the internet or faxes. So it was quite challenging. I can imagine. And how has the feminine hygiene market changed in the past few years? 
Do you see a growing request for more sustainable products? The market has changed in the past few years in respect that after climate change protests, people are looking at what the impact of lifestyle products has on people's lives and the future sourcing of materials. So I would say that aligned with the the climate action activity, interest in transparency of where products are made, what they're made from, where they're from, human rights, everything has been focused. So definitely the change is across all products and particularly in feminine hygiene where women's rights activists also in the environmental movement, particularly in the US and to much further back, even in France, in Germany, it has changed at a pace in the last five years, but it's always been there in the background, but with the inability to take any action to bring about change. Now, can you tell us a bit more about NatriCare's hygiene products and about your eco-design process? When I wrote my design plan back in 1989, and that still stands today, the objectives were for as much as possible to source totally chlorine-free pulp, and there are are sources for totally chlorine pulp, and to, to move to organic cotton for our cover, and to address the plastic pollution, which is the PE layer that's in most feminine hygiene products and in diaper products, and it's across the industry, they're just either smaller or larger. I've always found in product development, sustainable product development, the industry of suppliers is too many years behind the ideas for change, too many years behind consumer demands. Raw material suppliers are always at least 10 years behind what I'm looking for. So beyond consumer trends, how do you see our environment evolving, including regulatory environment? I'm looking at a circular economy. I mean, the U- European Union with their Green New Deal are looking at with their Sustainable Products Initiative, which is now in regulation, are going to be introducing digital product passports. And my, I rub my hands together in glee and say, oh, thank goodness, <laughs> we have some disclosure here. In particular, can you tell us about the impact of using bio-based materials in terms of both health and end of life? My perception of health is one that is environment and personal health together. You can't separate one out from the other. If you're putting something into the environment that's going to have a negative impact, ultimately our health is going to be impacted. End of life, for me and my agenda as much as possible, is for something to be compostable. And currently the EN 13432 looks for 90% over 90% to achieve that. And with the current product that we have, the current adhesives that we're using, which are conventional adhesives, we are achieving that, but only because we had to reduce the amount of adhesive on the product to the point where it did not impact on the performance of the product. The recycling aspect is never going to be an issue for personal care products. It can't be. It's very difficult to recycle. So uh, we have to be looking at end of life as composting. So it is something that can be, it can be achieved and the adhesives changing to the adhesives will make it a lot easier. But in addition to that, we also have USDA bio-based and the higher up the bio-based content you get, obviously you are better for the environment. So bio-based adhesives and compostal adhesives both have a place in challenging the environmental impacts and end of life. I see. And do you see bio-based materials as the most prominent trend in the hygiene industry today, or are there any others? You have to drive the industry and make sure that consumers see that you can go forward and you can produce functional products that deliver quality and also deliver on their expectations for protection of the environment. So I think the bio-based trend is accelerating. There's still confusion in it because... I've seen through my work that I did with Greenpeace Labs that there are plant-based biomaterials that consumers are buying, especially on the semi-rigid, on the promise that, okay, they're plant-based, therefore they must be better for the environment. They are exactly the same as petroleum-derived plastics. They act in the same way in the environment. So there's a lot of confusion. So I feel that in the rush to get to bio-based, just like it did with the difference between degradable and biodegradable. The two things are being 
conflated as being exactly the same. So there has to be transparency. And I think eventually it will be the way forward. It's like, um, I guess, I mean, I, my tampons were certified organic when people really didn't understand even what organic food was, you know, in the, in the 1995. So consumer knowledge kind of takes a while, but then it gallops. It's very hard to go back on that. And we're, I think we're getting close to that kind of critical mass of thinking, especially amongst young women. And what's the biggest challenge that you face? The biggest challenge is, is really the adhesive. The objective with the one wall facing me now that has faced me for 32 years is an adhesive that is not going to release toxins into the environment, is readily compostable. That would be my, my hiatus. If I win the gold medal, it would be compostable. The conventional products that are not conforming to the sustainable products regulation should be taxed so that, you know, good design, good solutions, good eco design is not impeded by the costs of raw material development that have to be passed on to the consumer, you know. So there is, that really is not just reaching that best product, but not being penalized for making all those ecological and moral decisions to get there by cost. What would you say Bostik could learn from Natricare's eco-design approach? I would say to Bostik, don't be the last to the one, don't be the last to the table, but be, you know, be competitive, be a product that can be used efficiently and quickly and in the markets, because I think that sustainability comes at you from all sorts of directions. Is it sustainable in its sourcing? Is it sustainable in in its market? Is it sustainable in its financial? You know, it may be the best thing you can produce, but it can't sustain the economic pressures. So I think you have to look at it in the round because it's not just about producing a great formula. It has to be, where does it come from? Because with this digital product passport, everybody in the supply chain is going to have to be totally transparent in every aspect of the raw material that's going into the end product. That includes you and me, because unless that happens, um, the objectives of a, you know, a greener economy of reducing greenhouse gases and pollution and waste is never going to be achieved. So companies need to cooperate with each other? Uh, transparent cooperation. I think cooperation more than anything. I think our goals should be like your goals too, because we're defining where the market in our category is going and you should be looking to where your development can go that is relevant for what is now the present and the future. We're nearly at the end of this episode, but before we go, could you tell us if we had to take away one thing from this interview, what should it be? I think industry has a great place to play in, in the development of humankind. We've seen that with, you know, we had the industrial revolution, which has put us where we are now in good ways and bad ways. Now we're in the green revolution because that's the only solution we have to deal with climate change. We need to challenge design schools to think outside of their curricular boxes and create something new and innovative. It might seem like a silly idea today, but I can guarantee that working it through in three years time, it's going to be a solution. And you have to be given space to make that, those silly design discoveries, if you like, not to think, oh, well, we're wasting time, we're wasting money, we're wasting resources by doing this, because I can guarantee that somewhere in, in Bostick, there are groups of individuals who are already thinking along these lines, just may not have a route to correspondence to where those ideas need to come to fruition. So there you have it. This season of Transitions has come to an end. Thank you so much for listening. Susie, thank you for stopping by and telling us about eco-designing hygiene products. We hope that NatraCare carries on growing and doing good in the world. Thank you very much. To those of you listening, thank you for joining us. Goodbye. So now that you've heard Susie's perspective, you'll hear mine on the same topic of sustainability and absorbent hygiene. Hi, I'm Jack Hughes, Global Digital Marketing Manager here at Bostic, and you are listening to Bostic Talks. Bostic Talks. 
So I've been at Bostic a little over six years. I'm on the marketing communications team with an emphasis on digital. Some of the sustainability and innovations that we have been working on, I, th I think the big one would be our responsibly for hygiene initiative. It's a combination of education. So educating the market, our customers and, and others in the market about the sustainability trends that are happening. And also it's about Bostic's approach to sustainability. So that includes our sustainable projects and what we're doing as far as sustainability goes within the kind of production side of, of creating adhesives, but also the, the actual adhesives themselves. So we've recently launched a few sustainable adhesives. So BioSource, bio-based adhesives, that is the Nupla series. And we've got three versions of that out right now, two construction adhesives. So the construction portion of, of a absorbent hygiene product, and then one wetness indicator. So essentially it indicates when a diaper has been soiled. Um, and so we have some BioSource products that, that meet those needs have heard of NatraCare and, and heard of Susie before in, in the industry because of her work. I know in her interview, she mentioned the adhesive producers to, to work on a compulsible adhesive, I believe is what she asked for. And that is, you know, definitely something that we're working on. Yeah, we also have projects going for compostable, for recyclable products. Um, so yeah, it's something that we are definitely aware of in the industry. I guess first, I'll say that the adhesives that we use are, are incredibly safe. They meet all safety and regulatory requirements that are necessary for any of the products that our adhesives are included in. But we also know that, that consumers obviously have a, a strong desire for transparency, and, and Susie mentioned that in her, her discussion. And the industry as a whole, which would be you know producers like her, um, suppliers like us, we're, we're all working and evolving to meet that need for transparency. And as a material supplier, Bostic, we receive a range of requests that come to us from supporting producers on their transparency goals. And, and that's something we've done to also, you know, meeting their needs for circular solutions. And we're working hard to meet those needs. Our goal is for the adhesive to be an enabler to whatever end of life solution the producer of the product is aiming for. I would say the challenges that we're meeting are kind of threefold or I'll cover kind of the, the three big ones that I see. So first is there there isn't unanimous agreement across the industry on what the best end of life solution is for hygiene products. So Susie mentioned that you know she would like to see compostable. There are other companies in the industry working on recyclability. Then so there's not that uniform consensus on what the end of life solution should be. So that could be very challenging for a supplier like Bostic when we're getting those different requests from different producers. Two, related to that, if tomorrow every producer in the market said, we want to move to all sustainable substrates like cotton or PLA or hemp or whatever it is, that the challenge with that is currently there aren't enough of those materials available in the market to support that volume. I mean, billions upon billions of products um, of absorbent hygiene products are produced every year. and. Right now, there are just not enough materials to support that if, if all of those were to go sustainable tomorrow. But at the same time, producers, uh, the producers within the, the industry can be reluctant to switch over to those more sustainable products completely until they know that there is enough demand from end consumers and enough supply from those, those growers or those producers of the sustainable materials. And, and then <laughs> compound that, many end consumers are reluctant or unable to switch over to more sustainable products until the prices become more competitive, which isn't going to happen until there's a higher supply. And then the third kind of challenge that I see is, again, related to that, that previous point I just made, if, if every producer switched to producing, say, a compostable product that, that Susie mentioned, in most places in the world, the facilities aren't in place to compost all of those products. So while I agree with Susie that it would be great to be able to have all products be compostable, at the current scale, I don't think it's feasible. We're developing adhesives that will enable the recycling or the composting of products. So I feel confident that we'll be able to continue to adapt and grow with the industry as we have for the last five plus decades. Thank you so much for following this episode. 
I hope these trends have inspired you and maybe even given you some ideas. If you want to learn more, you are invited to listen to Transitions, the series that deciphers these trends in depth. Goodbye. So there you have it. You now have the perspectives on sustainability from two people working on different ends of the industry, but ultimately with the same goal in mind, to push our industry to produce more sustainable products and towards a more sustainable future. Attached to Hygiene is brought to you by Bostic and is hosted by me, Jack Hughes. It is produced and edited by me with the help of Paul Andrews and Michelle Tonkovitz, Emery Chernis, and Nikki Ackerman at Green Onion Creative. Our post-production is provided by Podcast Boutique, and our theme music is by Jonathan Boyle. We'd like to extend a thank you to Susie Hewson for contributing her insights to the Transitions podcast, and to the team here at Bostic that manages both the Transitions and Bostic Talks podcasts for allowing us to borrow the episodes you heard today. If you'd like to hear more episodes from either podcast, you can find more information in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.